fabulous intern over at the VA. Um, he's done an absolutely fantastic job. The interns, I don't think, have any idea what they're getting themselves into until they get over there. And <laughs> but uh, he's done a fantastic job um, lining up our surgeries for us and making the transition uh, to, the, to the Moran um, much easier. But he'll be talking about angiotens or angiotensin converting enzyme and corneal neovascularization. I'm going to turn the time over to him. Thanks, uh, Snow, for that kind introduction. <coughs> I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to speak this morning. As an intern, I'm not drawing from a deep well of uh, knowledge and experience, but I did want to take <coughs> this opportunity to share with you some research that I had uh, the opportunity to be a part of as a third and fourth year medical student. So, uh, And that was in this uh, particular area, looking at the potential connection between uh, angiotensin converting enzyme and corneal neovascularization. So just by way of introduction, um, <coughs> those of you with clinical experience know that uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, enalapril being one, are among the most uh, common antihypertensives um, prescribed for hypertension, uh, and they have been since the 1960s when they were introduced. They act on uh, the renin angiotensin system, which you can see outlined in this graphic over here. Specifically, they act uh, at this step, which is um, the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme. And angiotensin 2 carries out most of the physiologic functions in this uh, cascade, and it acts on two well-described receptor receptors, the AP1 receptor and the AP2 receptor. Um, specifically, it has two broad areas of effect. One is by increasing aldosterone expression. And aldosterone works in the kidney to increase sodium resorption and thereby increasing fluid volume and um, <coughs> blood pressure. It also has several uh, aldosterone independent effects, uh, one being vasoconstriction, antidiuretic hormone release. Antidiuretic hormone acts on the distal portions of the, the nephron to um, lead to uh, free water resorption. And also down below, I put some more recently described uh, actions uh, of the downstream effects of angiotensin II, which includes cell proliferation, chemotaxis, and increased VEGF transcription, uh, VEGF being vascular endothelial growth factor. <coughs> so if you look at this group that I've outlined in yellow, it's quite interesting when you look at uh, increased cell turnover, the migration of cells, and elaboration of cytokines like VEGF, those are all key precursors to angiogenesis and neovascularization. So um, it's quite interesting to think that uh, blockage of this cascade may affect those uh, cellular activities as well. So just kind of a little background as to how these activities were described. So this is kind of an interesting case study as to how research works, which often starts with an intriguing observation, which leads to an idea, which leads to testing that idea um, first in the lab, in vitro, in petri dishes, then in animals, and then in humans. So it started about <coughs> a little over 10 years ago in 1998 when a man named Lever and his colleagues made this interesting observation, just epidemiologically, that hypertensive patients undergoing long-term treatment with ACE inhibitors had a decreased incidence of breast and lung cancers. And here you can see that it's a little over half, 0.65 versus 1.1 percent. And uh, this was very interesting. They didn't have a whole lot of background as to why this would be the case at the time, but it certainly tweaked a lot of ears and got a lot of people going in the lab as far as looking at why this would be the case. Fast forward about 10 years, and we can find that individuals with certain ACE gene uh, insertion deletion polymorphisms, which lead to increased ACE activity, have a 38 to 80 percent increased incidence of breast cancer. And this increased risk can be ameliorated or even reversed by ACE inhibitor therapy. So can you imagine going to your doctor and saying, um, I have a really strong history of breast cancer in my family. What can I do to decrease my risk? And most of us wouldn't think to give our patients an antihypertensive, but that's what this uh, study appears uh, to suggest may be a benefit in these certain individuals. Fast forwarding from the observation phase to the testing phase, multiple studies um, have demonstrated that ACE inhibitor therapy decreases uh, in vitro preneoplastic lesions, cellular proliferation, angiogenesis, and VEGF in human carcinomas in petri dishes in the lab. This is very interesting. This pretty recent.
recent research in 2007 and 2008. So moving on from in vitro studies to models in animals, mouse models of lung, gastric, pancreatic carcinomas have demonstrated that the way that ACE inhibitors um, decrease angiogenesis in these models is by blocking transcription of VEGF. So the way that they did this is they looked at all these different models and then they looked at circulating, circulating VEGF levels in these animals. And what they found is that in these animals with these particular models of cancer, um, if they treated them with ACE inhibitors, that the VEGF levels in their sera was markedly reduced. So studies in both animal and human tumors have demonstrated a correlation between the extent of angiotensin receptor expression with VEGF expression in those tumors, tumor angiogenesis, and tumor invasiveness. So not only uh, does it appear that this cascade that I showed on that second slide, the renin angiotensin system, affects uh, the elaboration of VEGF, it also affects the clinical characteristics of a cancer, uh, as in its um, ability to invade surrounding tissues, form new blood vessels, um, and uh, elaborate these cytokines. So some of you may be asking, well, why is Daniel speaking so much about cancer when this test is supposed to be about blood vessel formation in the eye? So I did my training in Arkansas, so you have to forgive me, but the areas of research on cancers and neovascularization are really kissing cousins, and that's because uh, these cancers often, when they uh, have such high metabolic activity, they have such a demand for tissue, uh, such a demand for blood, they have to recruit their own blood supply that obviously is not a part of the normal anatomy. And one of the ways they do that is by elaborating these cytokines, VEGF being one, and it's a very potent stimulator of new blood vessel formation. This next uh, bullet is a little bit closer to home for us as eye care professionals, and that shows that a couple of recent clinical trials have shown up to a 65% reduction in the progression of diabetic retinopathy in patients who are on ACE inhibitors or ARB. And so this is from an uh, article uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009 and also the DIRECT trial, which stands for the Diabetic Retinopathy Candesartan trial. Um, and we've known for some time that in patients with um, diabetic retinopathy, particularly proliferative diabetic retinopathy, that if you look at VEGF levels within the vitreous, that they're quite elevated. So uh, this does make some sense. Yes? They looked at both uh, in these studies. They looked at uh, progression of um, MPDR and uh, PDR. Specifically, they looked at uh, progression of, well, obviously the, the earlier um, progression where they had more room to go forward was reduced more than the, the far advanced of PDR patients. Primarily, yes. But even PDR was reduced in these studies. I'm not trying to suggest that it isn't. That certainly is a possibility, and they address that in the study itself. So what can we take from all these lines of evidence? What's the take-home point? <coughs> I would suggest that the downstream uh, cleavage products of the renin angiotensin system uh, via all these lines of evidence have been shown to promote angiogenesis in a wide variety of settings, from in vitro models to, uh, to um, animal models, and thus inhibition of this cascade may represent a new uh, therapy or direction for trying to block angiogenesis in vivo. And so that's what we decided to look at. So our question was this, will inhibition of ACE with enalapril block corneal angiogenesis in a rabbit model of VEGF-induced corneal neovascularization? So again, we're kind of drawing from our animal companions on this uh, planet to tell us a little bit about the human condition. So. First, in order for this to be a feasible experiment, we have to show um, that there is a local renin angiotensin system in the cornea. If there is not, then we have no reason to believe that systemic treatment with enalapril would have any localized effect. And actually, local renin angiotensin systems have been well described elsewhere in the body, um, including cardiac, lung, vascular, and particularly renal tissue, and even elsewhere in the eye, including the ciliary body, vitreous colloid, and retina. But in perusing the literature before this study, it, it is really not all that well characterized in the cornea. 
so how did we decide to address that? Um, since we knew we were going to be using a rabbit animal model, we decided to look at ra uh, rabbit corneal culture, specifically rabbit corneal fibroblasts and rabbit corneal epi epithelial cells, which you can see over here. Uh, we extracted mRNA from these cells, and then via standard uh, microbiological techniques, um, we transformed that into DNA, amplified that DNA, and then um, ran um, specific primers to look for expression of specifically angiotensin converting enzyme, AT1 receptor, and AT2 receptor expression. So what did we find? Up at the top you can see uh, this is a, a standard gel of uh, these PCR products. You can see a DNA ladder on the left. And uh, what you can see is that uh, this top one is the rabbit corneal fibroblast. We found ACE expression, AT1 receptor expression, and AT2 receptor expression. Of course, to prove uh, that this is a high quality a gel, you have to run both positive and negative controls. So our positive con control was beta actin, which is a standard um, housekeeping gene that's present in almost all cells. And then the negative control was uh, the primers with just water. So you wouldn't expect any PCR products to be seen uh, in that column, and that's exactly the case. So here in rabbit corneal fibroblasts, we found all three elements of that initial cascade that we showed. Um, down here is the rabbit corneal epithelial cells, and interestingly, in the epithelial cells, we found AT1 receptor expression and AT2 receptor expression, but no angiotensin converting enzyme. And again, um, good control. So uh, with this evidence in hand, we felt comfortable moving forward with the second phase of our experiment, uh, experiment including animals, uh, being that systemic therapy with enalapril may have a localized effect on the cornea, given the fact that all the players are present. So we decided to use uh, New Zealand white rabbits, and we induced corneal neovascularization in these animals by implanting a VEGF pellet in their paracentral cornea. Um, after that, these groups of rabbits were uh, randomized into one of two conditions, the first of which received uh, intramuscular water injections every day for 14 days, and the second of which uh, received enalapril intramuscularly every day for 14 days. <coughs> we used three milligrams per kilogram, which um, for those not uh, familiar with rabbit dosaging, um, it's a relatively low dose. Um, we got it from this paper in 1997. We had initially wanted to use a higher dose of the enalapril, uh, but the IRB was a little bit concerned about uh, inducing hypotension in the animals, which is legitimate, and so that's why we decided to go ahead and uh, use that dose. <coughs> we monitored the animals via a slit lamp microscopy at days 4, 9, and 14 to monitor for um, the uh, development of corneal neovascularization. And the way that we quantified that was by calculating the mean area of corneal neovascularization using ImageJ software, which is provided by the NIH. So this is <coughs> a little bit of insight into uh, my life as a third and fourth year medical student in the lab. Um, if today you think you're having trouble keeping your um, patient in the slit lamp, try a rabbit for a while and see how that goes. Um, these are some um, representative images. You can see this VEGF pellet here with some new blood vessels coming in. And quite often what we see uh, in corneal neovascularization is that these blood vessels arise from this plexus of vessels that runs around the limbus uh, towards that um, stimulator of the vascular uh, neovascularization in the first place. Um, and then this other image is designed just to show <coughs> that within the rabbit corneas there was not a significant amount of edema or inflammation incited by this nearby VEGF pellet. All right, so here we get to a little bit more of the meat of the study itself. So here we are at day four. On the left is the control treated animals. Remember that they received um, intramuscular water and then the enalapril treated animals on the right. So here you can see uh, just this little fronds of um, neovascularization uh, originating from uh, the limbus and um, emanating towards that potent stimulator of neovascularization, that VEGF pellet. Um, and even at day four, you can start to see um, that uh, this amount of neovascularization uh, is more in the control group relative to the treated group. Fast forwarding to day nine, you can see that these same vessels uh, have progressed towards the VEGF pellet and uh, in some cases are 
uh, beginning to uh, surround it and uh, infiltrate it. You can see that this process is a little bit further along in the enalapril treated view, uh, but if you look a little bit more closely, what you can see is that in the control group, there are increased number of blood vessels uh, emanating from um, the limbus, and also those vessels um, tend to branch more as they get closer to this VEGF pellet. So if you look at the enalapril treated group, uh, you can see that there are fewer uh, blood vessels originating from um, the limbus, and as these move towards the VEGF pellet, they demonstrate decreased branching. <coughs> And obviously, the more branching you have, that would exponentially increase um, the mean area of amyloid vascular casing. All right, so um, here we are at day 14, our last uh, point. So uh, what you can see is here in the control group, there's uh, quite a lot of vessels that have encompassed that whole VEGF pellet. Um, so relative to the uh, enalapril treated group, <coughs> you can see there's a whole lot more um, blood vessels emanating from the limbus. And they demonstrate increased, again, increased branching relative uh, to the enalapril treated group. So <coughs> these are some immunohistochemical slides. We do not choose to quantify uh, these results, but basically, immunohistochemistry um, denotes uh, taking um, an antigen, uh, uh, antibody to a particular antigen on a cell type or a, a portion of a cell, and then attaching to it a little fluorescent marker so that you can shine a light and see exactly what uh, it has attached to. So in this um, particular um, immunohistochemistry um, slides, we uh, use DAPI to stain cell nuclei, um, and so those show up blue in these photos. Um, and this is corneal stroma, um, so you can see a lot of cell nuclei. Um, and we use lectin to stain uh, vascular endothelium, so obviously uh, it's very important that corneal stroma be clear and free of blood vessels to maintain uh, good vision. So any amount of neovascularization or red staining uh, in these slides is abnormal. And uh, so you can see that uh, the VEGF pellet induced um, neovascularization in the corneal stroma in both treatment conditions. Uh, however, in the control group, um, you can see quite a bit more red staining diffusely throughout um, the corneal stroma relative to the enalapril treated group. Those are corneal sections, which was uh, stained with um, DAPI and lectin. I'm sorry? Flat plate? Flat mounts. No, we did not do that. We just took uh, sections. All right, so what are the results of this study? So we've already kind of gone over this first part, but um, a previously undescribed renin angiotensin system exists uh, within rabbit uh, cornea. So uh, specifically within rabbit corneal fibroblasts, that's where we saw all three of the players of this cascade. So uh, angiotensin converting enzymes, A21 receptors, and A22 receptors. Uh, corneal epithelium again showed A21 receptors and A22 receptors, but no ACE. And then moving on to uh, some of the quantification of uh, the slides that we saw earlier of the images at the different time points. Um, we saw that the VEGF pellet was quite good, surprising no one, at um, st stimulating corneal neovascularization, uh, yielding a mean area of corneal neovascularization uh, in the control group of 1.8, 2.8, and 3.2 millimeters squared on the three tested time points, respectively. Uh, enalapril treatment, by contrast, decreased the amount of corneal neovascularization in these animals by 44% uh, at four days, 28% at nine days, and 31% at 14 days. And you can see the uh, actual uh, hard numbers there. So that's actually two different Exactly. Um, two of them were and one wasn't. And we'll go over that in this slide too, which is a graphic uh, representation of these same um, results. Uh, I know this is a little bit of a busy slide, uh, but here on the y-axis, you can see the blood vessel area in millimeters squared. The x-axis is the time and days. <coughs> the black bars uh, represent uh, the control animals, and the white bars represent the enalapril treated animals. So there's a few things to notice about this. <coughs> this uh, psi symbol here represents that at days 9 and 14, there was statistically significantly more corneal neovascularization than was present on day 4. So our VEGF pellet was doing a good job at inducing 
and continuing to induce corneal neovascularization as the um, experiment progressed. And you can see at all three time points, as we saw in the, pr in the photos and in the um, raw data, that um, the enalapril-treated animals demonstrated less corneal neovascularization than uh, their controlled counterparts. What this asterisk denotes is statistical significance. Um, and so we can see that only at days 4 and 14 was that deemed statistically uh, significant by Kilo and Ova customers. Yeah. The psi, uh, I was saying that that represents that at days 9 and 14, there is a statistically significantly more corneal neovascularization uh, relative to our first tested time point. So what conclusions can we uh, draw from this admittedly limited study? So um, we can say that there is a, uh, the components of a previously undescribed mini angiotensin system within rabbit corneal, specifically rabbit corneal fibroblasts, and it appears to play as an important role in corneal angiogenesis. I say that because, um, as we've seen, treatment with enalapril or blockade of this renin ang angiotensin system uh, statistically uh, signifi uh, significantly reduced corneal neovascularization in a VEGF model uh, in rabbit. So what future directions could we take? Uh, what could we look at from uh, trying to build on this knowledge? So future studies are needed to explore the therapeutic uh, potential of uh, enalapril in other animals and potentially in humans. It's important to note that if you look at the literature that um, corneal RAS expression is highly variable among different animals and even among mammals. If you look at um, rat and dog cornea where these have studies have been done, they haven't found uh, angiotensin 1 or ACE expression. And so in order for this to be applicable to humans, one would have to do the same uh, experiment on human corneal tissue, which uh, to my knowledge has not been done at this point in time. <coughs> Obviously I've already alluded to this, um, but we could use higher doses of enalapril, which might uh, induce a more robust response. Uh, and I elaborated our reasoning for using a relatively low dose uh, before. Um, also, we used a very potent inducer of corneal neovascularization in VEGF. Um, so one could use a number of different means to induce corneal neovascularization, including uh, chemical, uh, trauma, thermal, or a number of different um, um, inciting events. <coughs> so those are all areas for s future research. And lastly, I just want to thank uh, the staff, the resident, everybody for making this a great four-month rotation. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot. I'm excited to be coming back. Uh, I'll be counting down the days until I get to come back. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I'll be counting down the days until I get to meet this little guy. My wife is um, 38 weeks pregnant with our first son, a boy. Um, his name's going to be Levi, so we'll be meeting him soon. I'll open it up to any questions. I have a, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, Dr. Rolf. So uh, an excellent work that you did way back in the day four and five years ago with your team. Thanks. So, so I'm trying to understand this because uh, you keep saying it's very hard to find these things that are sort of clean and all that. Mm -hmm. so Exactly. Right. So it's a very good point about um, looking at whether um, it would block uh, formation of VEGF or whether it would block uh, utility of already formed VEGF. And from looking at these studies of 
animal models of tumors, um, it's unclear whether um, the blockade occurs at the level of formation or utility, whether um, something about it blocked, but nevertheless the VEGF redu reduced. And that's a good point that it could well be um, decreased formation. And it's a, in fact, that might be the more likely um, response. But it wasn't clearly elaborated in these studies that I read up to this point. This, so <coughs> um, so that's a good point. You know, it Right, so that would be, you know, statistically significant from our study is that uh, at least in this model of VEGF, there's really not a whole, there are other ways that it could have blocked, but these uh, appear that uh, at least RAS blockade appears to disrupt uh, the VEGF uh, function within the eye um, and within other uh, angiogenic so models. Right, right, that's true, yeah, that's a good point. Right, exactly. Right. No, and that would be an excellent way to address uh, both that question and the question Dr. Olson posed, you know, to look to see the circulating levels of VEGF. And we did not specifically uh, measure or quantify the circulating or the, lev the localized levels of VEGF either in the cornea or in the animal itself. That would be a very good point. <coughs> yes, Dr. Hurd. <coughs>
Thank you very much. <clears throat>